Hello everyone and a warm welcome to the module devoted to the structure and bonding in organic molecules. You may recognize the model shown here as DNA, the molecule that carries the genetic instructions for making all life on Earth. The helical shape of DNA was discovered in 1953, and the detailed arrangement of atoms in the DNA molecule determines whether it is a recipe for an ant, an antelope, an anorhinum, or anthrax. You may also have recognized this molecule as Buckminster fullerene, a soccer ball-shaped allotrope of carbon. Buckminster fullerene, named after the architect of the geodesic dome, which it resembles, was first identified in 1985 and earned its discoverers the Nobel Prize for Chemistry in 1996. Now, my question is this, how did you recognize these two compounds? Your answer probably will be that you recognize their shapes. Molecules are not simply a jumble of atoms. They are atoms held together in a defined three-dimensional shape. A compound's properties are determined not only by the atoms it contains, but also by the spatial arrangement of these atoms. Graphite and diamond, two other allotropes of carbon, are both composed only of carbon atoms, yet their properties, both chemical and physical, are completely different because the carbon atoms are arranged very differently. Graphite has carbon atoms arranged in sheets of hexagons, while diamond has them arranged in a tetrahedral array. We understand the shapes of molecules through methods like atomic force microscopy, which allows us to see them, though not literally, of course. Atomic force microscopy reveals the shape of penicine, the molecule we typically represent with the structure you see here, as shown on the left. This is the closest we can get to actually seeing the atoms themselves. Most analytical techniques reveal the shapes of molecules less directly. X-ray diffraction provides information about the arrangement of atoms in space, while other spectroscopic methods, which you will encounter later, reveal details of the composition of molecules or the connectivity of the atoms they contain. Through methods like these, we come to understand the shapes of molecules. That is why in the previous module, I urged you to make your drawings of molecules realistic as we know what is realistic and what isn't. Now, we need to address the question of why molecules have the shapes they do. What properties of their constituent atoms dictate those shapes? In this module, we will discover that the answer not only helps us explain and predict structure, but also enables us to explain and predict the reactivity of organic compounds. First of all, we need to consider why atoms form molecules at all. Some atoms, inert gases, for example, do so only with extreme reluctance, but the vast majority of atoms in the periodic table are much more stable in molecules than as free atoms. Here, for example, is methane, for hydrogen atoms arranged around a carbon in the shape of a tetrahedron. Molecules hold together because positively charged atomic nuclei are attracted to negatively charged electrons, and this fact allows electrons to act as glue between the nuclei. The carbon and hydrogen nuclei of methane are of course positively charged, but the 10 electrons, 6 coming from carbon, for from the hydrogen atoms, bind those positive charges into a molecular structure. Ammonia and water also have 10 electrons in total, and we know that their molecular shapes are, in fact, just like that of methane, but with one or two hydrogen atoms removed. This tells us something important. It is the number of electrons that determines the shape of a molecule, not just the number of atoms or atomic nuclei. But what determines how electrons are arranged? Why do 10 electrons give rise to a tetrahedron? Before we can answer these questions, we need to simplify our discussion a bit and think about electrons not in molecules but in individual atoms. We can then approximate the electronic structure of molecules by considering how the component atoms combine. However, it is important to remember throughout this module that molecules are only very rarely made directly by joining atoms together. What I am going to present is an analysis of the structure of molecules, not a discussion of ways to build them. Much of what I will cover was worked out in the decades around 1900, and it all came from experimental observation. Quantum theory explains the details, and you can read much more about it in a textbook of physical chemistry. My aim here is to give you enough understanding of the theory to be able to use sound principles to predict and explain the structure of organic molecules. 
we shall start with a discussion of some evidence about the existence of atoms and electrons. Many towns and streets are lit at night by sodium vapor lamps, which emit an intense, pure yellow-orange glow. Inside these lights is sodium metal. When the light is switched on, the sodium metal slowly vaporizes. As an electric current is passed through the sodium vapor, an orange light is emitted. This is the same color as the light you see when you put a small amount of a sodium compound on a spatula and place it in a Bunsen flame. Given sufficient energy from the electric current or from a flame, sodium always emits this same wavelength of light, and it does so because of the way electrons are arranged in a sodium atom. The energy supplied causes an electron to move from a lower energy state to a higher energy or excited state. As it drops back down, light is emitted. The process is a bit like a weightlifter lifting a heavy weight. He can hold it above his head with straight arms, but sooner or later, he will drop it, and the weight will fall to the ground, releasing energy with a crash, if not a broken toe. This is the origin of the lines in the atomic spectra not only for sodium but for all elements. The flame, or the electric discharge, provides the energy to promote an electron to a higher energy level, and when this electron returns to its ground state, this energy is released in the form of light. If you refract the orange sodium light through a prism, you see a series of very sharp lines, with two particularly bright ones in the orange region of the spectrum at around 600 nanometers. Other elements also produce similar spectra, including hydrogen. Since a hydrogen atom is the simplest atom of all, we will look at the atomic spectrum of hydrogen first. The absorption spectrum for hydrogen was first measured in 1885 by a Swiss schoolmaster, Johann Balmer, who also noticed that the wavelengths of the lines in this spectrum could be predicted using a mathematical formula. You do not need to know the details of his formula at this stage. Instead, let's think about the implications of the observation that a hydrogen atom, with just one electron, has a spectrum of discrete lines at precise wavelengths. It means that the electron can only occupy energy levels with precisely determined values. In other words, that the energy of an electron orbiting a proton is quantized. The electron can have only certain amounts of energy, and therefore the gaps between these energy levels, which give rise to the spectrum, likewise can only have certain well-defined values. Think of climbing a flight of stairs. You can jump up one, two, five, or even all the steps if you're energetic enough but you cannot climb up half or two-thirds of a step. Likewise, coming down, you can jump from one step to any other. Lots of different combinations are possible, but there is a finite number, depending on the number of steps. You may have heard of an electron orbiting a hydrogen nucleus previously, as that is one way of thinking about an atom as a miniature solar system with the nucleus as the sun and the electrons as planets. This model breaks down when examined in detail, as we shall see shortly, but for now, we can use it to understand why electrons must exist in quantized energy levels. To do this, I need to introduce a concept from 19th century physics, the experimentally observable fact that particles such as photons and electrons can also exhibit wave-like behavior in addition to their particle-like nature. It is not immediately obvious why the energy of a particle should be quantized but it makes sense if you allow yourself to think of an electron as a wave. Imagine a taut string, such as a piano wire or guitar string, fixed at either end. You may well know that such a string has a fundamental frequency. If you make it vibrate by hitting or plucking it, it will vibrate in a manner represented in the diagram on the left. This diagram depicts a snapshot of the string. Alternatively, we could represent a blurred, image showing all the possible positions of the string as it vibrates, similar to what you would observe with a slow shutter speed in photography. This is not the only way the string can vibrate. Another possibility, shown on the left, has the ends of the string and a point in the middle, known as a node. The wavelength of this vibration is half that of the previous one, doubling the frequency. Musically, this vibration sounds an octave higher and is called the first harmonic. The third and fourth possibilities for allowed vibrations are shown below, corresponding to further harmonics. Even if you are new to this concept in music or physics, you can see that the vibrating string must adopt one of these quantized frequencies. 
This is because the fixed ends of the string require the wavelength to be an exact divisor of the string's length. Frequencies are directly linked to energies. The energy levels of a vibrating string are quantized. Thinking of an electron as a wave makes it easier to understand why it can have only certain energy values. If you imagine an electron orbiting a nucleus like a string looped back on itself, you can visualize why only certain wavelengths are possible. These wavelengths have associated frequencies, and the frequencies have associated energies, providing a plausible explanation for the quantization of electron energy. The popular image of an atom as a miniature solar system, with electrons behaving like planets orbiting the nucleus works in some situations, but we need to move beyond it. The problem with this view is that electrons can never be precisely located. Instead, they must be thought of as smeared out over the space available to them. This arises from Heisenberg's uncertainty principle, which states that we can never know exactly both the location and the momentum of any particle. With quantized energy levels, we know the energy of an electron, which means we know its momentum, and therefore we cannot precisely determine its location. As a consequence, we must consider electrons and atoms and molecules as having a probability of being in a certain place at a certain time. The sum of all these probabilities gives a smeared out picture of the electron's behavior, similar to blurred pictures of vibrating strings. Since an electron can move freely around an atom in three dimensions, the allowed vibrations it can adopt are also three-dimensional and are known as orbitals or atomic orbitals when considering electrons in a single atom. The shapes of these orbitals are determined by mathematical functions called wave functions. The smeared out picture of the simplest atomic orbital, the lowest energy state of an electron in a hydrogen atom, looks something like the picture shown here. Alternatively, we can represent an orbital by drawing a line, in reality, a three-dimensional surface, encompassing the space where an electron spins, for example, 95% of its time. This gives something like the picture on the right. The simplest possible orbital, the fundamental orbital of the hydrogen atom, is spherical and is known as a 1s orbital. Higher energy atomic orbitals have different shapes, as you will soon see. It is useful to think of atomic orbitals as a series of possible energy values for an electron. We can consider them as occupied if there is at least an electron at that energy level and unoccupied if there isn't. In a hydrogen atom in its most stable state, there is only one electron occupying the lowest energy 1s orbital. Therefore, this picture of the 1s orbital gives a good representation of what a hydrogen atom looks like. We can also represent the 1s orbital as an energy level, with the electron that occupies it represented as a small arrow, which I will explain shortly. What happens if you put more than one electron into the orbitals around an atom? Well, for reasons I cannot go into here, each orbital can hold two electrons, and only two, never anymore. This is known as the Pauli exclusion principle. If you add an electron to the hydrogen atom, you get the hydride anion which has two electrons around a proton. Both electrons occupy the same spherical 1s orbital. Here again, we can represent the orbital occupancy as an energy level occupied by two electrons, indicated as arrows. You may ask, why do we draw the electrons as arrows? Well, electrons possess a property known as spin, and the two electrons allowed in each orbital must spin in opposite directions. The arrows serve as a reminder of these opposing spins. The same is true for the helium atom. Its two electrons occupy the same orbital. However, the energy of that orbital, as well as all other possible orbitals, will be different from the orbital for hydrogen because helium has double the nuclear charge of hydrogen, causing the electrons to be more strongly attracted to the nucleus. We can represent the orbital occupancy like this with the energy level lower than that for hydrogen due to this stronger attraction. So far, so good. Now, let's consider lithium. The lowest energy 1s orbital around the lithium nucleus can contain two electrons, but only two. Therefore, the third electron must go into a higher energy orbital, one of the energy levels inferred from atomic absorption spectroscopy. You can think of this orbital as the three-dimensional equivalent of the first harmonic of a guitar string. Like the vibration of the string, this next orbital has a node. On the string, 
the node was the point where no motion was observed. In an atom, a node is a point where the electron can never be found, avoid separating the two parts of the orbital. For the orbital containing the third electron of the lithium atom, this node is spherical. It divides the orbital into two parts which nestle one within another, like the layers of an onion or the stone inside a peach. We call this orbital the 2s orbital 2 because we have moved up to an orbital with a node, like the first harmonic, and s because the orbital is still spherical. Originally, the s did not stand for spherical, but as all s orbitals are spherical, it is fine to remember it that way. In a lithium atom, the 1s orbital, which is close to the nucleus, is occupied by two electrons, while the 2s orbital, further from the nucleus, contains one electron. In beryllium, there is a second electron in the 2s orbital. As before, the energy levels change as the nuclear charge increases. Therefore, the orbital occupancy in lithium and beryllium can be represented as shown here. When we get to boron, something a little different happens. It turns out that for an orbital with one node, such as the 2s orbital, the node does not have to be spherical. The node can alternatively be a plane. This alternative arrangement for an orbital with a single planar node gives us a new type of orbital, the 2p orbital. A 2p orbital looks something like the picture on the left in smeared out form. It is often represented as the propeller shape in the middle, and it is conventionally drawn as the shape shown in the diagram to the right. I will explain shortly why only half of the picture of the p orbital on the right has been filled in. Unlike the 1s or 2s orbitals, the 2p orbital is directional, it points along an axis, and in three dimensions there are three possible orientations for the axis, each of which gives rise to a new 2p orbital, which we can call 2px, 2py and 2pz if we need to. The planar node of the three 2p orbitals gives them just slightly more energy than a 2s orbital, which has a spherical node. Therefore, Boron atoms have two electrons in the 1s orbital, two in the 2s orbital, and just one in one of the 2p orbitals. The orbital occupancy is shown in the energy level diagram on the right. You can imagine the shape of each of the orbitals. On the left, there is a picture of them all superimposed. The next element, carbon, with one more electron, seems to have a choice. It can either put its sixth electron paired with the fifth one in the same 2p orbital or it can put it into a new 2p orbital, leaving both electrons unpaired. In fact, it chooses the latter option. Electrons are negatively charged and repel one another, so if there is a choice of equal energy orbitals, they occupy different orbitals singly until they are forced to start pairing up. The repulsion between electrons is never enough to force an electron to occupy a higher energy orbital. However, when the orbitals are otherwise of identical energy, this is what happens. This principle is known as Hund's rule. An atom adopts the electronic configuration that has the greatest number of unpaired electrons in degenerate orbitals. While this may seem theoretical as isolated atoms are not commonly found, the same rule applies to electrons in degenerate orbitals and molecules, as you will see in the following lecture. Not surprisingly, the orbitals of atoms of the remaining elements of the first row of the periodic table are occupied as shown here. As the entire set of orbitals goes down in energy due to the nucleus attracting the electrons more strongly, filling up the 2p orbitals first singly and then doubly is a straightforward process. With the 10 electrons of neon, all the orbitals with one node are filled, and we say that neon has a closed shell. A shell is a group of orbitals of similar energy, all with the same number of nodes. Look at the diagrams below, which are the same as the ones you saw earlier. They represent the first three vibrational frequencies of a string. Now think about the motion of the string itself. In the first vibration, all of the string moves up and down at the same time. Each point on the string moves by a different amount, but the direction moved at every point is the same. The same is not true for the second energy level of the string during a vibration like this. The left hand half of the string moves upwards while the right hand half moves downwards. The two halves of the string are out of phase with one another. And there is a change of phase at the node. The same is true of the third energy level again. There is a change of phase at each node. 
The same is true for orbitals. A nodal plane, such as that in the 2p orbitals, divides the orbital into two parts with different phases, one where the phase of the wave function is positive and one where it is negative. The phases are usually represented by shading, one half is shaded and the other half not. The phase of an orbital is arbitrary in the sense that it does not matter which half you shade. It is also important to note that phase is nothing to do with charge. Both halves of a filled 2p orbital contain electron density, so both will be negatively charged. The plus and minus signs merely indicate the phase of the wave function. As it happens, the electron density at any point in the orbital is given by the square of the mathematical function, the wave function, which determines the phase. So both positive and negative values of the wave function give positive electron densities. You will learn about the importance of phase in the following lecture, especially as we will start combining atoms to form molecules. We are about to delve into the concept of orbitals to understand how electrons behave in molecules. But before we proceed, let's clarify a few points about orbitals that can sometimes cause confusion. First of all, orbitals do not necessarily need to contain electrons. They can be vacant, similar to how a stair does not need someone standing on it to exist. Helium's two electrons fill only the 1s orbital, but with an input of energy, such as the intense heat in the sun, one of them can move up into the previously empty 2s, 2p, or 3s orbitals. In fact, it was the observation of the energy absorbed by this process from Earth that led to the first discovery of helium in the sun. Electrons may be found anywhere in an orbital except in a node. In p orbital containing one electron, this electron may be found on either side but never in the middle. When the orbital contains two electrons, one electron does not stay in one half, and the other electron in the other half, both electrons could be anywhere except in the node. All these orbitals of an atom overlap with each other. The 1s orbital is not contained within the 2s orbital. Rather, the 1s and 2s orbitals are separate entities capable of holding a maximum of two electrons each. However, the 2s orbital does occupy some of the same space as the 1s orbital and also as the 2p orbitals, for that matter. For example, carbon has a total of six electrons, two in the 1s orbital, two in the larger 2s orbital, and two in the three 2p orbitals. All these orbitals overlap with each other. And finally, as we move across subsequent rows of the periodic table, starting with sodium, the 1s, 2s, and 2p orbitals are already filled with electrons. Therefore, we must begin putting electrons into the 3s and 3p orbitals, followed by the 4s, 3d, and 4p orbitals, with d orbitals and f orbitals, which start to be filled in the lanthanide series, there are yet further new arrangements of nodes. I won't be discussing these orbitals in detail here. You will find detailed consideration in an inorganic course. However, the principles are just the same as the simple arrangements I have described. Thank you for your attention, and I am looking forward to the following lecture where we will discuss molecular orbitals and bond formation in some simple diatomic molecules.